Hello, I'm Jerry Wasserman, uh, actually Jerome, but we'll call myself Jerry, and you can call me Jerry too. Uh, lived in Omaha, Nebraska since 1936, part of the Jewish community since then. But uh, let me explain where, where it all came from originally. Uh, my grandparents on both sides lived in Russia, and uh, for one reason or another, uh, the political structure of Russia, the czars, the pogroms, uh, the, uh, the military uh, type of situation that was in Russia, uh, led a lot of Jews to leave there, and along, my grandparents were along with them. Um, my father's parents came to this country uh, approximately in 1899, uh, or 1898 approximately, uh, they had only a couple of children. I, I think my dad was the first one born in this country, and eventually they had uh, 14 children, uh, seven boys and seven girls, uh, that were living, and I believe there was one that miscarried. Uh, how my grandmother, who I never knew, and I never knew my grandfather on my dad's side of the family, uh, because they had passed away before I was even born, uh, could survive all those children, I know not how, but they matriculated to uh, Wisconsin uh, and lived in the Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, and Upper Iowa areas. <coughs> Excuse me. And on my mother's side, uh, they came from uh, uh, Minsk, uh, which was oftentimes argued over whether it was Poland or uh, Russia, uh, and uh, where I remember my grandfather because he was the only one that was alive uh, when I was a youngster, and he passed away uh, when I was approximately four years old here in Omaha. They came uh, to this country. My uncle and my grandfather left Russia through Vladivostok and came to the west coast of the United States and wound up in uh, Sioux City, Iowa where they had relatives. My mother and my grandmother went the other way through uh, Europe and came in through New York. Uh, so uh, putting it all together, exact dates and everything, I, I can't do that. But they, uh, they met in Sioux City and uh, established themselves there. My father, grandfather was in a bakery uh, and worked in Sioux City and uh, homesteaded in South Dakota to get some free land as they did in those days. My other grandfather uh, was in... Uh, in the grocery business, owned a theater, did several things. Those people, you know, something looked a little bit better because they really had nothing as a basis to operate with when they got here. They only had themselves and their families and uh, the ability to work hard to try and make a, uh, a life for themselves. But uh, they operated uh, a theater in Minneapolis and then a, a general store in in uh, northern Iowa and uh, where my father and mother met was um, my uncle Dave Roden met my aunt Idell who was a Wasserman and got married and lived in Sioux City. At that time my dad was in uh, the military during World War One. And uh, when he came back, uh, at, actually he served another hitch in the military after World War I in uh, Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. And after he got out of the Army, it was sort of a arranged situation. They said, well, why don't we fix up your brother with my sister type of thing. And my mother and father uh, met in Sioux City and got married. And um, my dad had saved a little bit of money uh, when he was in the military. 
And uh, my mother was working, although she came to this country as a, as a 12 year old, uh, she was working in Sioux City for an auto agency as a bookkeeper. My mom was a fast learner, she learned English well, but I always chuckle a little bit because uh, she used to spell some of our, her English words phonetically. She spelled it how it sounded, and she's not the only one. A lot of uh, uh, refugee uh, people did that as they learned English. But she was a bookkeeper, and when they got married, they moved to, uh, to Coon Rapids, Iowa. And uh, they bought a little general store there, and of course, uh, being probably the only Jews in Coon Rapids, uh, were not readily welcomed by the Gentile population of Coon Rapids. Uh, the family, one family of Jews, uh, probably in the thought of some people, was too many. After they got to know my folks, my folks became successful in Coon Rapids, Iowa. Their store was viable, and uh, they. Uh, developed a good rapport with the farmers and the people that lived around there and, and did a nice uh, business. And then uh, they were uh, talking to one of the purveyors from Sioux City, uh, a gentleman that called on him, and t he told them about a store in Blunt, South Dakota. It was a bigger size store and it was a pretty good store and uh, maybe my dad would be interested. So. He hopped in the car of the day, whatever it might have been, and drove to uh, Blunt, South Dakota, and looked over uh, the uh, situation there, and decided that would be a, a good store. It was bigger, and it covered more territory, and uh, Blunt was about 20 miles from the state capital of Pier, along uh, the sort of the area of the Missouri River, and. Uh, they decided that they would move there. In the meantime, my brother and sister had been born in uh, in uh, Coon Rapids, and uh, they picked up the family and moved to Blunt, South Dakota. Uh, they were born in, at home with midwives, and in my respect, and my mother was tired of having kids at home, I guess so. She went to stay with the relatives in uh, the latter days of her pregnancy with me, and I was born in a hospital in Sioux City, Iowa. However, uh, that's what my birth certificate says. However, I uh, I was really a South Dakotan uh, by birth. The uh, fact that that's where we lived, and we lived in Blunt, and then uh, my brother, who was seven years older than I, were. Uh, they were starting to think of, of their Judaism, and uh, there were a few Jewish families in Yankton, South Dakota. So my dad moved uh, the family to Yankton uh, to be with other Jews, and uh, decided uh, that that was better for our family to grow. But we didn't stay there but a couple of years, and it was about time for my brother to start with a Jewish education and they moved to Sioux City to try that. You can notice we sort of followed the Missouri River downstream and uh, in Sioux City my dad sort of learned the the novelty business or the carnival supply business from my uncle who was in that business, uh, Dave Roden, and uh, thought, you know, he, he wasn't sure what he was going to do, and we stayed there for a while. And uh, there became a store in Omaha called Globe Novelty Company, which had gone bankrupt, and my dad heard about it, and he came down to look at Omaha. And uh, he had looked elsewhere in the country. He'd gone to California because he had brothers and sisters there, and decided California wasn't his cup of tea. It was a little too fast for my dad, and uh, he came to Omaha and looked at the Globe Novelty or the remnants of Globe Novelty Company and decided, well, here's a here's a city that had about at that time about six synagogues, and not a lot of big ones, but there was a, a Beth Israel and Temple Israel, there was a Bethel 
synagogue was just forming uh, and was a conservative congregation, seemed to fit their needs and the family's needs. And my my brother uh, oh, could start Hebrew school and my sister could go to Hebrew school and become more uh, a part of a Jewish community, uh, which Omaha has had for years and years and is still viable today. And the only problem with today is uh, the kids grow up, they move away, they want to go to a bigger city where there are more job opportunities, I guess. Some of them stay here. But in the meantime, we moved to Omaha in 1936. I was just uh, four, the latter stages of four years old, and uh, we moved here in 36. I turned uh, five at the end of that year in December. And I actually, I started school here in Omaha. And uh, my dad bought the Globe Novelty Company and changed the name of it to XL Merchandise Novelty Company and uh, became a, uh, a merchant catering to the needs of traveling carnivals, uh, which extended itself greater and greater into other areas uh, as it went along. As most carnival supply businesses have, they became uh, and they catered to the needs of organizations for fundraising uh, and then the decorations and party favors and all those type of things uh, became part of XL Merchandise and Novelty Company. In the meantime, I started school because we lived, lived near 42nd and Dewey Street. Can't remember the exact address. It's all the area that's owned by the University of Nebraska Hospital these days, but uh, we rented a house there. And uh, I started school at Harrison, not at Harrison, uh, a Columbian school, which is uh, uh, just off of Leavenworth and about uh, 38th, 39th, somewhere in there. Uh, and uh, I went there for a year to the kindergarten. And then my folks found a house at 54th and Western Avenue where uh, they had an opportunity to buy it. Uh, in those days, the mortgage rates were pretty low, and they had enough to make a down payment at the 5320 Western Avenue. And we had a school, Harrison School was about two blocks away, which in those years only went to the fifth grade. And uh, I started Harrison School, which I went to until I graduated from the fifth grade, I guess you'd call it and uh, then matriculated to Dundee School uh, where I finished my grade school uh, tenure and then went on to uh, Central High School. But I can remember uh, walking from 54th and or riding my bike from 54th and Western Avenue to Dundee School and in those days uh, we joined Bethel Synagogue uh, in 1936 or 37 when we moved here, and there was no Bethel Synagogue. There was a congregation, but the congregation met at the Jewish Community Center uh, during the regular sessions of, uh, of services and schooling. We used uh, the Jewish Community Center. And for the high holidays, they used the American Legion Club, which was across the street from Central High School, uh, about 21st in Dodge, approximately. And they had an auditorium there that they'd rent for the high holidays. And I can remember my consecration, my beginning of going to Hebrew school. Uh, I still have the book today, is signed by Rabbi Goldstein. Uh, was held at the Jewish Community Center. And then they uh, started the building at 49th and Farnham, and uh, we continued on with Bethel and uh, still belong to Bethel Synagogue today. So it's been a, a long run with uh, one synagogue. <coughs> and uh, in high school, at Central, I went to Central and take the bus downtown. My dad used to go to work too early to get a ride with him. I didn't want to go to school that, that bad. So uh, I'd take the uh, streetcar or the bus downtown and go to Central and then walk down to my folks' store at 1316 Farnham Street 
after school and uh, I would wait there and maybe study a little and uh, ride home with my folks after they closed the store. Uh, in those days we shopped at places like uh, like Safeway and Hinky Dinkies which are two stores that are not existent today. Uh, my dad used to open at 8, close at 5, uh, five days a week. On Saturday he'd close early so mom could go shopping. So instead of closing at 5 he'd close at 4 o'clock. I used to go down to the store at uh, and Saturday mornings after going to junior congregation I'd take the streetcar uh, downtown and I would work at the store or fool around whatever you want to call it as much as my dad could tolerate me, uh, I would uh, sweep the floors and all that, and then he'd give me enough money, I'd go have some lunch and go to a movie, uh, this was with 50 cents, I could uh, have lunch for 15 cents, go to a movie for 15 cents, buy popcorn for a nickel and I still had a nickel left, so it's, uh, that was my first attempt at making any money. Uh, I used to mow a few lawns when I got old enough, an old push mower in the neighborhood, make a dime here and a quarter there. But I uh, lived a regular outdoor life with the, the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, we were just about the only Jewish family in the neighborhood, but I hadn't, didn't have a lot of trouble growing up with these kids. Uh, we became pretty good friends. Uh, not many of them are left or even left in Omaha anymore. And. Uh, of course, I touched a little, had a little anti-Semitism, but kids in those days, they only echoed what they knew from their parents or what they'd hear from their parents. They didn't know what uh, real anti-Semitism was. Uh, it, it's too bad that, uh, that parents have things to say that they really should have never said. Maybe it'd be a lot easier to get along in this world and we'd find out that we're really not so different that we've made those partitions that, uh, that separate people today. But in the meantime, I, I went to Central High and I uh, graduated in uh, 1948. And uh, I, I remember the things like uh, my bar mitzvah at uh, Bethel. My, my brother, of course, was in World War II and was in the Army. And I remember Rabbi uh, Goldstein reading a telegram that uh, came from my brother from Italy. He was uh, at the Anzio Beachhead, but he was always a pretty good finagler. He was a company clerk. How he got a, a telegram out of Italy during the war, I, I know not. But I, I did uh, have a telegram read to me from my brother. Uh, a telegram of uh, congratulations that uh, on my bar mitzvah all the way from uh, Anzio in Italy and uh, he served in the army and returned home after the war and uh, my sister was going away to college I was becoming you know more cognizant of, of, of things growing up and more responsibilities although I didn't uh, really get a lot of responsibility and uh, I went to college for two and a half years and didn't realize what it was really all about until the Korean War came along. And at that point uh, I was two and a half years into college and I thought well I can take off some years serve my country as best I, as best I can and, but I thought I'd be sly and join the United States Coast Guard I thought that should be a pretty safe place to go. And not that I was afraid, but you know, there were so many horror stories during the guy, the poor guy suffering in Korea, and I, I had empathy for him in the mud and the cold of Korea. Uh, I thought that she was, I, you know, I'd, maybe I'd take a better route. So I went into the Coast Guard. However, I still hold the Korean battle rabbit. <laughs> we I found out the Coast Guard isn't only in the United States of America. We were all over the world. Uh, I served in the Korean theater, uh, served out of Hawaii, uh, 
and, and got a, that's where I got a true education on what life is all about. Served in the Philippines, and uh, it was a, a dramatic experience for my life. I, uh, I, I am thankful of the time that I spent in the service. It was a time to grow up, and I came back with a more realistic look of what life is really all about after I got out of the service. Uh, I still look back, though, to when I was a, a small kid, and I, I still remember fondly my the one grandfather that I did know, the one grandparent, uh, Louis Roden, who, uh, who was a man uh, who was well-liked and had a curly head of hair till the day he, day he died. It was salt and pepper, just thick and curly as it could be, and a big mustache and a good, a good sense of humor. Uh, was a was a good man, yeah, but I didn't understand fully when he passed away where he had gone to. I just uh, I just didn't really understand that much about the life and death uh, thing that we all have to you know face at some time in our life. So uh, I missed him, uh, and I couldn't quite explain to myself why uh, he was gone. But that's, you know, later on in life you realize that those are the things that happen. And I, uh, I enjoyed him while he was here. He lived with us. And uh, I enjoyed the trips to Sioux City when I was a youngster because we often visited with our, uh, the rodent side of the family. My Aunt Idell, my Uncle Dave, and my my cousins, uh, Sid uh, Roden and Helen Roden and Ducky Milder, now Ducky Milder, uh, Lois Lee is, was, but nobody called her Lois, it was always Ducky, because she's, uh, she was always in the water. They had a swimming pool in her backyard, and uh, when she was uh, six, we were both six at the time, she taught me how to swim, but she was constantly in the water all the time, so they called her Ducky. But uh, it was a good time, and I had an uncle, my uh, uh, wife's uncle, uh, Roden Yusha, lived in Council Bluffs. And I remember the days uh, when we all sat around for Passover, this huge table, and there were, you know, 15, 20 people for a Seder, and they'd all be talking. But Uncle Yosha would be at the head of the table reading the whole Haggadah in Hebrew, which, of course, none of us kids really understood. Uh, but when it was time to eat, we, then we understood. But it, uh, it is those things that uh, I can look back at and say, why wasn't I more proficient at reading Hebrew and more under, proficient at understanding? But uh, I, was, I was a good outside the, the house. So, uh, playing uh, football, playing baseball, playing whatever games the kids played, running around, riding a bicycle. It was sort of a carefree childhood and with my both my parents working we, we were not we were just mischievous enough just to be mischievous but never never anything uh, that went out of hand uh, totally that uh, would really get us into trouble. Uh, is as far as uh, in the service, I that's where you learn uh, really how to get along with people. Because when you're isolated on a ship of about 250 guys out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or the uh, the South China Sea for uh, periods of anywhere up to 32 days at a time without seeing land, you better learn how to get along with people. And that's what I've tried to do uh, basically in life is is get along uh, I mean you don't have to take a back seat to who you are but uh, you don't have to offend people because you think that maybe you're a little better than or there is no such thing as being better than anybody else the, the thing in life is uh, is how you associate yourself with other people and try and put yourself in their place. I have several cousins 
with my dad's family of 14 children that I rarely, I, unfortunately, I never really got to know them very well. Never got to know some of them at all because uh, as the Jews dispersed from Israel in the early days uh, to wherever it might have been in Europe, to England, to the United States, my dad's family dispersed from Wisconsin to New York, to Indiana, to California, to to, uh, to all different places. And in those days, nobody traveled like people travel today. And I just never really, and, but my mother and her sister in California, Aunt Sophie, were, were very close. And my mother would take me to California on the old Union Pacific Streamliner, whatever the name of it was, the city of Los Angeles, I, I don't know if that's the right name, but as a kid, she'd pack a suitcase for her and a suitcase for me. We'd get on the train and we'd ride in three days and we'd be in California and we'd be there for a week or 12 days. And then we'd get on a train and we'd ride back to Omaha, Nebraska. And that the, <clears throat> so I saw some of the country that a lot of kids never got to see. People just didn't travel. Our biggest traveling was between Sioux City and Omaha. Uh, about every other week we would either drive to Sioux City or the relatives in Sioux City would drive to Omaha. So there was a, there was a good uh, camaraderie type of thing with our cousins in Sioux City. Uh, the, there was another, my, uh, my Aunt Sophie, married a gentleman by the name of Al Feinberg, and the Feinbergs lived in Sioux City also for some time until they decided to go to California. So that's why my mother would pick me up and take me to California. Also, one of my favorite uncles uh, lived in California, my Uncle Bernard, who was a younger member of my dad's family. And uh, I got to know him pretty well. Some of the others are, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's because there was such a division in my father's family that I never got to know them real well. They were never very receptive uh, to relatives for whatever the reason may be. I'll, I'll never know. Uh, one of them is still alive today. Dale Wasserman, who became rather notable in the theater uh, uh, show business and is still writing today. I, I presume that's what I've heard anyway. Uh, and, but he was a loner and uh, even though he, and, he was cordial to my dad, he, was, uh, he, he didn't feel the family ties. I feel very close to my sister. Uh, I felt very close to my brother. Unfortunately, he died when he was 40 years old. Uh, I was in love with my mother. My mother was a very, very wonderful lady. My dad was a little bit gruff uh, at times, had a temper, and, you know, he, he couldn't yell at my mother, so he'd yell at the kids. Never yelled at my sister, though. She was, <laughs> I would say she was his favorite. I don't know if that's a truism or not but uh, he'd yell at the boys much easier than he would at my sister. And maybe deservedly so because they're a little unpredictable at times in our actions, but we had a good life. And uh, be it as it was, uh, we, we were, always had clean clothes on. We, uh, we were never pampered uh, to the point of, although my dad in the later days did, I guess he'd have to pamper call it pampered a little bit because I really uh, almost passed out when I was in the Coast Guard. My first station was Grand Haven, Michigan, and I came home on leave and I used to have to take a bus all the way from Grand Haven through Chicago, from Chicago to Omaha, and my dad said one day I was here on leave, he says, why don't we buy you a car? So he took me car shopping and bought a very slightly used Chevrolet two-door. Uh, it, it was a 
regular front and back seats, but in those days they made two-door automobiles with no doors in back. And I, like I said, I almost passed out when he said that, and of course I, uh, I received it with great enthusiasm and I was able to drive back and forth. But when I got transferred overseas, <clears throat> I knew someday I would want another car. So I, uh, I sold it in California, and my mother and I drove to California. I'll never forget that trip, because uh, my mother wanted to stop in Las Vegas and play bingo. I always remember that, because we parked adjacent to the old Golden Nugget in those days, which I think it's still about the same place, but it, the whole building, of course, had been revamped since then. But in the Nevada desert in, uh, in the fall of the year, still pretty hot and uh, I wandered around the casino and uh, marveled at all the goings on there but my mother wanted to play a little bingo so she went to the bingo hall which was uh, upstairs over the golden nugget part of it and I wandered around and uh, she says come in about two hours I want to play bingo for two hours so she played bingo and I wandered around and didn't really get the feeling of Las Vegas till much later in life, but I remember going to get her, and I uh, I says, "Okay, mom, it's time to go. We still had to drive to Los Angeles, and I wanted to do it in the daylight." So uh, she said, "Okay." So we left, and we went down to get in the car. Well, the car had been sitting on the street, parked in the sunshine, and being as it may, with no air conditioning, the car was so hot I couldn't touch it. So I had to go into, into the Golden Nugget, and I borrowed a towel from the bar. I said, get it a little wet, and I opened up the car, and I had to, held the doors open, rolled down the windows for, for a little while till I could get in and touch the steering wheel. And then I took the towel back to the barkeep and, and thanked him for it. I had cooled off the wheel where I could hold it and drive, and we took off for Los Angeles with the windows open. It's the old old 460 air conditioner, you know, roll down four windows and go 60 miles an hour because that, you know, with no air conditioning, I was like, that car was really hot. But my mother and I laughed about that and uh, we had a good trip and uh, I left her in Los Angeles to go back on a train. Told her I sold the car and had her put the money in the bank so when I came out of the service I'd still have something to uh, something the money to buy a, a car with when I came home and uh, I remember while I was there it was just so the ha timing was perfect uh, my n cousin Rosalie Feinberg was her wedding weekend when I was there so I got to go to her wedding and then went and reported to the Coast Guard base in Alameda California and uh, went to Honolulu uh, where I was reassigned to a ship and uh, was on uh, one ship there for oh about a year and then got transferred to another ship and that's the ship that made the long extended trips to the uh, the uh, Korean area and uh, although we were very close to Japan we never stopped in Japan most of the time we stopped was in Hong Kong uh, and in the Philippines uh, for re-outfitting fuel and food and that type of thing. But we spent a lot of time on the water. And uh, I, uh, I think of my brother often uh, because he and I would have, well we were sort of business partners, my dad was getting older and it was destined to be that he would be, I would be partners in uh, Excel merchandise. That seemed to be the way things were going. And uh, unfortunately he had a heart problem, but in those days we didn't really know about heart problems the way they can find out things today. And he had a massive heart attack one day when he was 40 years old and uh, passed away. He left a wife and a daughter and uh, it was most unfortunate because uh, I was sort of the, at that time, I was the guy that lifted most of the boxes and he was the guy that 
had most of the ideas. Pretty smart guy, uh, even though we all have faults. He had a couple of uh, uh, problems uh, that uh, prevailed between he and my dad, but uh, it was not bad. It was uh, it was any that it was not anything that couldn't be reconciled and. And pretty basically was, but the thing was shocking when you when you go to lunch uh, one day and you come back from lunch and the front door of the building is locked and the shade is pulled down. And I couldn't possibly imagine what had happened, and I come to find out that uh, that he had had a heart attack while talking to a supplier. In California, ordering some merchandise, and it was uh, almost instantaneous death. He, uh, the guys that they came with the rescue squad, but uh, he was already passed away. So that was a a big shock. I, I had to do a lot of soul searching to understand uh, uh, what. In the world happened, my you know the parents always figure they're going to pass on before the children. And here my my dad was sort of uh, touching somewhat on retirement, and uh, my mom was still active in the business too. And all of a sudden, they lost their oldest child. It was uh, it was a time of reconciling things in my mind that were, it was pretty difficult. Uh, I found an outlet eventually, instead of a psychiatrist, I started bowling, uh, but which is uh, was a major part of my life after that. I got very interested in it. And uh, I, I can't help but, uh, but think of my sister too. Uh, she, of course, Raz is still living. She's uh, She's four years older than I. She's, uh, I won't mention her age, she'd probably get mad at me. But, but I'm 73, <laughs> you figure it out. But uh, she's a good sister. In fact, she's a great sister. And uh, I've always, uh, her husband Ike, was always a guy uh, with, a, with a good word and a helping hand and, and uh, Another guy that knew where he came from, and and was appreciative uh, of everything that he did in his life, and was a, what he was able to accomplish in his life, and always wanted to share his good fortune with the rest of us. He he was uh, he was quite a guy, and today my sister is still that type of person. She you couldn't ask for a better sister. She's a a, uh, a generous, wonderful lady who follows the tradition of her mother, who uh, is a nice person, a well-spoken person, a fair person. Uh, I might have mentioned before, my mother would always say to my dad, who was a little uh, gruff with some people, uh, not to their face, but Speaking of them, and my mother would always say, "Now, Max, uh, if you can't say anything good about a person, just don't say anything at all." And that's the way my, the philosophy of my mother's life, and that's the philosophy, pretty much, of my sister's life too. Uh, she had uh, my sister uh, has uh, three children: uh, Susie, who's still alive, and Alan, who's uh, still alive and lives in California. Susie lives here in Omaha. And Janice, who unfortunately uh, had uh, five children, passed away from cancer, who was as sweet as a youngster. She was a pain in the butt. But as, a, as a, she grew into adulthood, was the sweetest girl that you'd ever want to meet. She, Janice was just a, a wonderful young lady. Not that Susie and Alan weren't, aren't wonderful also, but Janice matured in a little bit different way than uh, than the other two. She was uh, uh, 
uh, I, I f felt a great loss when Janice passed away. But she's got uh, uh, five children who are all their own people. And uh, one of them is just getting, going to get married here in Omaha uh, come next Labor Day. However, I won't be able to uh, partake in that because my oldest granddaughter is going to become a bat mitzvah on Labor Day. That's, that's going to be in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, so I'm not going to be here. My sister can't come to the bat mitzvah and I can't go to her grandson's wedding, so it's a draw, but we understand uh, those things and uh, there is no problem there. I wish her well and she wishes me well, but she is uh, a very integral part of this community and uh, she's done a lot of good with uh, whatever Ike has left her and she's she, he told her to do good after he was gone and she certainly has. Uh, in the meantime when I got out of the service I met a little girl by the name of Phyllis Potash who uh, came from a family and has been in Omaha for, for many many years and uh, the coincidence is that my folks and her folks played in the same bridge club. I can't remember if it met once a month or met every other week or every week. It sort of, uh, I lost that uh, in the, the uh, remembrances, but they did play in the same bridge club with some other friends. And uh, of course, so I knew the pot ashes and I uh, knew Merle from high school. Phyllis just started high school when I got out of high school, but uh, they were uh, all those people in that bridge club, of course, they were all at my bar mitzvah, and they all, all of them, I think, belonged to Bethel Synagogue. And I can remember the, uh, the lunches that they'd have after they were done playing bridge on a Sunday evening. Uh, it was like yeah, a picnic, uh, the bagels, the cream cheese, the herring, the, all those things that, that, that from Jewish background that, the, that uh, Jews nosh on, you know, but uh, it was, uh, I used to sit on the stairway going upstairs and listen to them, and the, you know, we've all grown in our, my age group the same way. They'd sit at the dining room table <laughs> and they'd talk about the aches and the pains and the arthritis and the this, that, and the other thing. And it's, uh, it makes you laugh because now I'm at the age group, uh, you know, and doing the same things that they did as they uh, they went through the uh, the growth to the senior citizenship. But uh, I met Phyllis and. Uh, I saw her walking down the street one day and I was driving home. I had gotten my car after I got out of the service and I asked her if I could give her a lift home and it wasn't all that far. I think she had been to Chris's Rex Hall at, at 50th and Dodge and they lived at uh, 52nd and Farnham Street but I gave her a ride home and uh, Merle in the meantime got out of the service. He was in the Navy after I got out. Uh, and I went over to see Merle. So in those days, uh, Irvington was a, a place to go. He was uh, going with uh, Ruth Slavin, Ruthie, who is now, of course, Ruth Potash. And uh, I says, do you guys want to go out to Irvington and get some ice cream? Big deal. And uh, yeah, so that was unknowns to me. Uh, well, why don't you go along with them, Phyllis? Mrs. Potty said. And, oh, oh, okay, that's fine, you know. So uh, I, I got to know Phyllis better and we started the date and uh, we, one thing led to another and, uh, and uh, I asked her to marry me and she considered it for about five seconds. No, I'm just kidding. I'd say she she, uh, we decided to get hitched, and uh, it's it's been a good life ever since. Of course, like any couple, if you haven't had a few pitfalls in the road, you know, can't always agree on everything, but we agree on most most things with the, the important things. And uh, 
we got married and bought a house. I uh, had enough money, or my dad gave me enough money, I should say, but that was my interest in the business, I suppose, to make a down payment on a brand new house. It was 1,100 square feet <laughs> a house at uh, 3101 North 67th Avenue in Benson. And it was a nice little house on a corner and uh, made a good starter house for us. It was right near Benson West School off of, uh, off of um, Blondo and, uh, or Mel Maple Street, I'm sorry. And uh, we lived there. We had uh, our first child there was, uh, was Helene. And uh, then uh, when Michael came along, we finally realized how small those bedrooms were. It was a three-bedroom house. And uh, we decided to look for a bigger house. And uh, we found one. It was a three-bedroom house at 6958 Cumming Street. And uh, we decided that that was a house for us, so we bought that house. And then, as our family grew, instead of moving someplace else, we put an addition to the house. So we then had five bedrooms. It was a big house, and second, it would still be a pretty good sized house, so it was over 3,000 square feet. And we had a, eventually a bedroom for us and one for each of the kids, which uh, was was good. Uh, I, they gave them the opportunity to all be themselves. I, I like the idea. They all had their own things. They were all a mess, but uh, you know, you never see a, a youngster's room that doesn't have stuff, especially a girl's room doesn't have stuff laying. Uh, that's why we gave Helene the last room in the house. It was way back, you know. Nobody ever go back there to see what was laying around the floor. But the, all the, the boys were the same way. But they were good kids, and they are good kids. And uh, they, we grew up, or they grew up at uh, on, on Cumming Street until they were all gone. They'd all moved out for one reason or another. Uh, moved out of town, moved, got, got married, uh, whatever the case might be. And uh, we finally realized how two people would rattle around in a house that was, uh, was that big with five bedrooms and we only need one of them. So finally uh, we moved out and bought this house where we live today in North 155th Street, 734 North 155th. And uh, Phyllis didn't want a two-story house anymore. Actually, our house on Cumming Street had one flight of stairs from uh, the top floor down to the main floor, another flight of stairs from the main floor down to the family room, and another flight of stairs down the, from the family room to the basement, and she really wanted to eliminate the stairs. So we, we bought this house here in, in uh, Pepperwood and uh, lived here since then. And uh, we now have uh, all three of the boys uh, are married, have families. Andy lives in Euly, Nebraska, has a stepdaughter and two children, a boy and a girl. Euly's about uh, 50 miles from Omaha, north of Fremont. Uh, Steve lives in uh, the St. Louis area and has two boys and is a practicing attorney. By the way, Andy is in the, in the embroidery business, has a place in Fremont, Nebraska. And uh, Steve is, uh, like I said, is a, an attorney and has two sons. And uh, Michael has three daughters and lives in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. And I think I mentioned somewhere along the line, the oldest one is just turning 13. It will be a bat mitzvah come uh, Labor Day. And Helene is uh, still a bachelorette living in Evanston, Illinois, and is a, 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 a speech pathologist and got her. Uh, she liked Evanston because she went uh, to Northwestern to get her 
advanced degree, get her master's in speech pathology. And uh, she and her dog often come to visit at least a couple times a year. So it's uh, just like having a, we refer to him as our, our grand puppy, frisky little rascal, but he, he likes his grandma and grandpa and likes to come and visit us. And we see the other children, we go to Pennsylvania, you know, whenever we can. And Steve comes to St. Louis, from St. Louis. I, I can't drive as much as I used to. I used to like to drive to St. Louis. But after about an hour, hour and a half on the road, my knees get so stiff, it's, uh, it's pretty hard. But uh, we, we've seen him a couple times a year at least. And Andy, I go to work and help him in his business. I don't know exactly how much help I am, but I, I go and have a relationship at least a couple days a week. Uh, he and his wife are operating this business in downtown Fremont. And other than that, uh, we just uh, still partake in services at, at Bethel Synagogue, not as much as I used to because I sang in a choir there for over 50 years. And uh, I still sing today if I could, but uh, my age has robbed me of the the wind that I suppose you can say, the, the force that I need to sing with. And I just uh, just uh, sort of retired from that. I was a uh, bowler for... Uh, everybody should participate in some kind of athletics. If you want to call bowling an athletic endeavor, I, uh, I was involved in bowling for close to 40 years and still have a great love for the game, uh, but I, with arthritis and one thing or another, and knees, and uh, I, can't, I can't do it anymore, but I still was very near and dear to me. I made a lot of friends in the bowling community and uh, just attended the Bowling Hall of Fame banquet uh, uh, the other uh, Saturday night and uh, was uh, glad to see they installed in the Hall of Fame, although posthumously, uh, Rose and Leo Whites, who were longtime residents of uh, Omaha, used to be in the grocery business till I got into the the bowling business. Were very prominent in the in the bowling business here in Omaha, and I uh, I still see their son Arnie, uh, who's a stockbroker here in town. A lot of memories, a lot of memories uh, from the. A good Jewish community here in Omaha. Uh, I think that the Jewish community here in Omaha could be wrong. It seems to me to be growing instead of uh, the years that it sort of lost headcount uh, because the younger kids uh, moving out of town with the, the growth industries, uh, computers, one thing and another. Uh, the banking industry has, has attracted some uh, younger Jewish couples here to Omaha, and I see a lot more kids at, at Bethel Synagogue than, than I used to, or at least I remember. And uh, uh, Omaha is a good place to grow up. Uh, yes, Omaha has its problems, like any city has its problems, even the problems in the in the small towns like Fremont or uh, in Clarinda, Iowa, wherever, wherever today with today's uh, society, uh, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of uh, lack of respect uh, by young people that, that we used to have, at least I hope we had, for the older generation. But it's probably not, uh, probably is magnified by television today. Uh, more so than anything else, uh, the, used to, the papers mostly used to use good taste in the way they reported the news, but with television cameras today, uh, I'm afraid that they uh, are looking for sensationalism, going a little overboard on how they handle reporting the news. They make it seem a lot worse than it really is, although, yes, there are bad things out there, but there have always been bad things out there. I think most people are good at heart, and uh, 
want to be responsible citizens. And if there's anything I could, could tell my children or my grandchildren is uh, be responsible to what is right and what is wrong. And don't be critical of people just because they have a different opinion than you do. Everybody's entitled to opinion and as long as it is a matter of contention as to who's right and who's wrong or which way to turn the corner whether it's a sharp left or a gentle left or a sharp right or a gentle right or a middle of the road the old Indian saying was never judge a man till you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And it's a and it's the easiest thing in life is be considerate of others and uh, they'll be considerate of you, be understanding and hope that they're understanding. Uh, you know, as I reflect on my Judaism, this is ancient history that we're dealing with. Uh, we presume there's a God. Sometimes we wonder, there's so many bad things that happen. Uh, I look at the Holocaust and I, and I think, how could, how could, if there's a God, could there be such a terrible thing happen uh, to not only the Jews, but several Christians were killed in the Holocaust also. Uh, how could there be such a thing? But then, on the other hand, is God testing us? Uh, did he did he permit this to happen? And and bad things have happened for for every time, ever since the time started that we know of. Are, are we continually under test? Um, is it made, is it done to make us think that there are better things? Is it made to test us to be better people? We hope so. Uh, nobody's got the real answer or the right answer, although a lot of people claim to have their, all the answers, but it just doesn't happen the way, that way uh, as I see it. I think that uh, that if we stay true to ourselves and straight stay true to our families and true to our religion uh, that you can survive in this world and be a respected member of the community uh, and the entire community not just your religious community um, try and help people try and uh, be the best person you can and let to, in this regard, what the naysayers do and what they say. To uh, go to uh, my grandchildren, my children, to my wife. I love you and I respect you. And although I've had my bad days and my good days, try and remember the good days because nobody's perfect, and I certainly know I wasn't, but. There's a lot of love in my heart for you, all of you.